everybody. In today's lecture, I'd like to talk about phase diagrams. I had several resources for this. Schroeder's Thermal Physics, Giancoli's Physics, Principles of Application, and Callister and Rethwich's Material Science and Engineering. So we've discussed phases and phase transformations in a limited kind of way. So for example, if you have one atmosphere of pressure and then you change the temperature, so you're holding the pressure fixed and you change the temperature, then water will freeze at zero degrees Celsius or boil at 100 degrees Celsius. And we discuss the latent heats of those substances to figure out how much heat energy you have to transfer into or out of the system in order to get the phase transformation to happen. Um, but, of course, there's going to be more than one variable that can affect a phase transformation. So, for example, if you hold water at room temperature and then reduce the pressure, then you can get water to boil as well. And I usually do a demo of that um, in class where I put water inside a little bell jar and pump on it and it begins to boil at room temperature. So that's a fun demo to see. So how do we picture all of these things and talk about all of these things since there's more than one variable at play and it's not just the temperature? Okay, so uh, what would, for example, a change of phase look like on a PV diagram? Now, we've been using PV diagrams a lot over the course of our thermodynamics class. Um, so let's just take a little look about what would happen. So what we've got here is a PV diagram, and we have different isotherms at it. So we have temperature A, B, C, and D. And this is what the behavior of a real gas, for example, might look like on a PV diagram. And you can see um, on this curve, we have the uh, ideal behavior of an ideal gas plotted as dashed lines here, okay? So A kind of acts like an ideal gas until the pressure gets really high and then it starts to deviate from ideal gas behavior. And then you can see that B has a more significant deviation from ideal gas behavior. Remember that if you have an ideal gas and you're holding the temperature constant, then according to the ideal gas law, PV is equal to NRT, so P times V is a constant. And that gives you a hyperbola, and that is represented on an ideal gas law for the isotherm. But you can see that C and D deviate so much from a hyperbolic function that they don't even really look like it anymore. It's not even useful really to show that dash curve. So what's happening here? Well, the temperature at A is a lot hotter than, or is hotter than B, is hotter than C, is hotter than D. So D is the coldest. So what's happening is as the gas cools, then the further the gas is from being an ideal gas, okay? What happens is that lower temperatures, there's attractive forces between the molecules that then become more dominant. Remember that ideal gases, their temperature dictates their speed. And so if a gas is moving slower, then it has more time to interact with neighboring gas molecules, right, as they pass by. And so that allows attractive forces that are normally negligible to become dominant as the temperature cools. Then what happens is eventually the molecules begin to kind of stick together and then they become a liquid. So that happens here in the lower left region of our PV curve, okay? Um, and then the shaded region is kind of a mix of liquid and vapor. So at curve D, for example, let's follow curve D. Um, the gas is becoming a liquid there. And what happens is it begins to condense at B, okay? Remember, condensation is when a gas becomes a liquid. So it begins to condense at B, and then it's entirely liquid by the time it reaches A. Now, moving from B to A, you're going to have the volume decreasing with no change in pressure as it liquefies. <clears throat> All right, so that's what's going on at B. Now let's talk about curve C. Curve C represents the behavior of what's happening to that gas at its critical temperature. Now, the critical temperature um, is the temperature at which you can liquefy a substance if you have sufficient pressure applied. But above it, no amount of pressure can cause that gas to become a liquid. This was one of the things, for example, that um, made oxygen so difficult to liquefy. They were trying to pressurize it, but they didn't have the temperature low, low enough, okay? Um, and so what you have to do is cool it a lot. So here is the, a table of some different critical temperatures for various substances. And you can see, of course, water will liquefy at a very high temperature, 
Um, carbon dioxide will liquefy at a reasonable temperature, but oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, and helium, you have to get them really cold before they'll liquefy, okay? And then once you reach that critical temperature, you can raise the pressure, on, <clears throat> and that will cause it to liquefy. As you can see over here, this is the pressure in atmospheres, and so um, there you go. You can see that it's way above an atmosphere. Okay, now another thing is, and this is something that you need to bear in mind, some texts um, make a distinction between a gas and a vapor. Now, a vapor is a substance that's in a gaseous state, but below its critical temperature. So that's why in this shaded region, they call it a liquid vapor region. Um, and a gas is a substance that's in a gaseous state above the critical temperature. In other words, there's no way for it to become a liquid because it's above the critical temperature. Remember, the critical temperature is that threshold. All right, now we've been looking at PV diagrams, but honestly, they're a little hard to read um, for phase transformations compared to a PT diagram. So we often even call PT diagrams a phase diagram. Now, these things are a lot easier to interpret, as you can see looking at this one. It's easy to see when something is a gas, a liquid, and a solid, okay? So on the uh, PT diagram, what they generally do is draw lines like these red lines shown here and at the line that is the uh, temperature and pressure at which you can have the coexistence of two phases so for example this sv line right here that goes from the origin to the triple points that's the solid vapor line and so if you're at that point on the line then you can have a solid and a vapor in coexistence now here this is the lv line so you can have a liquid and a vapor in coexistence on that line, and then this is solid liquid right here, okay? This, by the way, is the phase diagram of water, which we all know and love, okay? Um, remember that the solid-liquid transition is melting or freezing, and the liquid vapor is uh, transition is boiling or condensing. The solid vapor one is sublimation, okay? All right, so one thing to point out on this ice-water um, diagram is that at one atmosphere of pressure, which is right here, right, um, and zero degrees Celsius, which is right here, you can have ice and water coexisting. And I'm sure you all have great experience with that of drinking ice water. Okay, so that's kind of fun. Now let's talk about a couple of other points on this graph. So right here is the triple point. It's where these three lines for the coexistence of all the phases intersect. Okay, now for water, this happens at 0 0.006 atmospheres and 0 0.01 degrees Celsius, okay? The triple point is where all three phases can coexist. So you could have ice water boiling at that, <laughs> at that uh, uh, position, okay? Now at lower pressures, of course, this is where ice sublimates. We're used to carbon dioxide sublimating, but maybe not so much ice. So this is where you get that happening. Now let's talk about another one. Let's talk about the critical point. This is the phase diagram of carbon dioxide, by the way. But you notice that it has a lot of the same features as the one for water, okay? So let's talk about the critical point. There's the triple point. Here's the critical point. As pressures and temperature rise, you've got a gas that's becoming more and more dense. And then as a gas becomes more and more dense, it's more tough to tell the difference in between a gas and a liquid. The differences between gases and liquids become less marked, in other words. And this point is called the critical point. Now, our text for thermal physics, which is Schroeder's thermal physics, they encourage you to hedge your bets as the gas approaches that critical point and just call it a fluid. Remember that in physics and in other fields as well, a fluid is a general term that's applied to either a gas or a liquid because they have a lot of the same characteristics, physical characteristics, okay? All right, now, previously we've talked about latent heats. And so, for example, we worked a lot of calorimetry problems where we had the latent heat of vaporization and the latent heat of fusion, right? And we worked problems with those. And then those generally happened at the phase transition point. So, for example, for water at atmospheric pressure, those phase transitions take place at zero and 100. That's the boiling point and the freezing point. But it's also true that you can get um, things evaporating and things condensing at temperatures other than 100 degrees Celsius, for example, or 0 degrees Celsius. We're all familiar with this because when we sweat, 
the, the water from our sweat evaporates from our skin, and that's a cooling process. And of course, that doesn't have to happen <laughs> at 100 degrees Celsius. It happens at lower temperatures too. It's just that the latent heat um, of uh, vaporization will change values as you change your temperature, okay? So, for example, if I pull up a website here, uh, let's see, engineering toolbox is a nice one. Let me pull this one up for you. You can find the latent heat of vaporization for um, different temperatures, okay? So here is a graph of the heat of vaporization of water in joules per kilogram as the temperature changes in degrees C. And you can see that it's a function of temperature, okay? Now, of course, it takes less energy to uh, evaporate water as the water gets hotter, okay? And you can see that happening as a function of the temperature, okay? So it's important to remember that these things don't just take place at the transition temperature. All right, now, if you are um, in a situation where let's say you have a glass of water sitting out, right, just sitting on a table, then what's happening is there are two processes taking place. The water in the glass is evaporating out of the glass, okay, so that's the evaporation, and then water in the air is also condensing into the water in the cup, okay, so both of those things are happening. When those two processes are in equilibrium, then the vapor just above the liquid is said to be saturated, and the pressure is the saturated vapor pressure. Remember, we talked about partial pressures of different gases in the air, okay? This was in a previous lecture. So, for example, uh, in dry air, you have about 80% nitrogen and 20% um, uh, oxygen, and so 0.8 atmospheres would be the partial pressure of nitrogen, and 0.2 atmospheres would be the partial pressure of oxygen, of course. We have trace amounts of other things, including water vapor in the air, okay? So whatever pressure, whatever partial pressure of water is in the air, if um, that pressure is the saturated vapor pressure of water, then um, this, these two things are in equilibrium. So let's look at what these vapor pressures are for different temperatures. Here's the temperature in the first column, going all the way from minus 50 C to 150 C. And here's the saturated vapor pressure in the second and third column for water. So you can pick, um, remember there's a lot of weird units for pressure. I'm going to look at the second column just because the numbers are a little bit more reasonable in size. So let's say that you're at zero degrees Celsius, right? It's cold outside, in other words. Then the saturated vapor pressure of water in the air is 4.58 torr. But if you're at room temperature at 20 degrees C, then the saturated vapor pressure is 17.5 torr. So what that means is that as you increase your temperature, the air can hold more water in it, okay? Now, it's also interesting, a liquid is gonna boil when its saturated vapor pressure equals the external pressure. So in class, when I do that demo of boiling the water inside of the bell jar as I you know, pump the pressure away, what's happening is, I'm not using a burner to boil the water. I'm simply reducing the pressure inside the bell jar until the pressure exceed or the pressure is lower than the saturated vapor pressure at that temperature, and then it boils away. Okay, so that's exactly what's happening. So remember, we talked about partial pressure. I was talking about it again. Remember that the partial pressure is the pressure each component in the mixture of gases would have if it were the only gas present, okay? And the partial pressure of water in the air can be as low as zero. I mean, if you're out in a really hot desert in the summer or something. And it can be as high as the saturated vapor pressure at that temperature. So you might have heard uh, meteorologists, weather folks, talking about a quantity called the relative humidity. And the relative humidity is a measure of the saturation of the air. So the relative humidity is calculated calculated by taking the actual partial pressure of water in the air at that moment and dividing it by the saturated vapor pressure of water for that temperature. And then you multiply times 100%, okay? Now humans are actually really sensitive to humidity. And that's because if the relative humidity is high, then it reduces how quickly sweat evaporates from our skin, okay? That's the mechanism that we use to cool our bodies, that we feel a lot hotter on a humid day because it's harder for the sweat to evaporate. 
humans like it when the relative humidity is about 40 to 50 percent. That's really, you know, optimum for our health and comfort. And when things deviate from that, we say that, you know, maybe it feels a little dry to us or it feels, you know, muggy, okay? So one thing that I've noticed living here in the mountains is that the air actually feels really dry inside buildings in the winter. And the reason for that is that the relative humidity outside is probably reasonable for that temperature, right? It might even feel a little wet, but it's cold out there. And so when you move inside the building, you're not going to have a very different partial pressure of water in the building from what you have outside, right? Because the air is flowing around um, and the, the amount of water just isn't going to be that different inside the building. But when you move inside the building, the saturated vapor pressure actually goes up because it's warmer in the building. So let's say that you're outside on a cold day and it's zero degrees Celsius outside, and the saturated vapor pressure of water in the air is, say, 4.58 torr, right? Well, let's say that it's comfortable out there in terms of the humidity, and so it's a 2.2 torr or something in there. But then you go inside the building, and it's now a saturated vapor pressure of 17.5 torr, but the partial pressure of water in the air is still 2.2 torr because that's what it is outside, and so it feels really dry in there, okay? So that's basically what's going on. Now, when the humidity is high, when it's above 50%, it feels muggy because it's hard for any more water to evaporate, okay? Now, you might have noticed if you go outside in the morning in the summer, you'll notice dew all over the leaves and the grass. And what's going on there? Well, the dew point is the temperature at which the air would be saturated with water. So if the temperature goes below that dew point, then you can see dew, fog, or maybe sometimes even rain, okay? All right, now I've been talking about phase diagrams that are relatively simple, but um, this these they can get really complicated because honestly, we've just been talking about the dependence of three variables, the pressure, volume, and temperature, but it could be even more complex than that. So for example, let's say that now we don't have a pure substance anymore. We have some mixture, okay? Like you may have done this experiment as a kid. You have sugar water, right? And then your teacher wants you to make sugar crystals by creating a super saturated solution of sugar water uh, by putting in a lot of sugar when the water is boiling and really hot. And then as you cool the water, you're supposed to put a stick or a thread or something in the solution. And as the solution cools, sugar crystals will form on your stick or on your string. And then you have candy, right? So if you haven't done that experiment as a kid, you really should do it because it's a lot of fun. Um, but let's explain what's going on with that. So now we have a phase diagram that has a, a dependence not just on pressure, you know, volume and temperature, but now we have a compositional dependence as well. So let's read this off. If we have on this bottom axis a composition percentage, in other words, a weight percentage of sugar, so we're zero over here, we're just plain water, and then all the way on the right-hand side at 100, we've got pure sugar, okay, no water. So in really, in reality, when we're at sugar water, we're going to be somewhere in, in here. Okay, so let's say we start off with room temperature water, and we add as much sugar as we can and dissolve it until no more sugar will dissolve. And then you have, like, sediments of sugar, like a little sugar sediment in the bottom of your pot or whatever. Then you put your pot on the burner and you start to heat the burner up and the water, the sugar water temperature starts to rise. You'll notice that as it starts to rise, more and more sugar will dissolve into that water, okay? And you can put a lot in. Let's say that you go all the way up to say, you know, 75 weight percent sugar when you get there and you have to reach 80 C to get that to happen. So you've dissolved a lot of sugar and then you take the pot off the burner and you let it sit there and you let it cool back down. Well, what happens is that as it cools back down, the amount of sugar that the water can hold reduces, and so it'll come out of the solution and make a solid crystal on your stick. So that's yet another variable um, that you can change. You can change the components and have more than one component, and then you have to worry about what the weight percentage of your composition is. Now, that was a relatively simple and straightforward example. We had two components, and it was uh, one was a solid, one was a liquid, right? So what else can happen, though? 
And this is something that we talk a lot about in material science. And if you're interested in this, I encourage you to look at my material science channel. But here, for example, is an image of aluminum and copper compound. Um, this is from Callister and Redwich. And I believe it's a scanning electron microscope image of it. Well, what happens is in a scanning electron microscope, um, the electron beam comes in and it strikes the uh, surface. And then a lot of those electrons get scattered straight back, kind of like the Rutherford gold foil experiment. And so what that means is that, you know, you have these big fat nuclei, say you're copper, and then you have the smaller nuclei, you're aluminum. Well, your big fat nuclei are going to reflect more electrons than your little nuclei. And so you'll get a difference, a contrast, in other words, if you have uh, an atomic number difference or fatter nuclei. So you can see different phases. What we're seeing here is an alpha phase, which is our darker phase, right? And that's probably got more aluminum in it. Uh, than copper, and then you have your beta phase, and that's going to be the one that reflects more uh, electrons. So that's the copper, that's the brighter, fatter nuclei, okay? Now, what's happening is uh, aluminum and copper aren't similar enough in size or structure or anything, and so you have uh, different crystalline structures that want to form for the aluminum and the copper. So if your structure mostly looks like the structure of copper, you'll have mostly copper there, and that's the bright. And if your structure of your crystal is more the aluminum structure, then that's the darker phase. That's one here. So it'll have the same crystalline structure and spacing as aluminum. And then, of course, because it's a mixture, you will have impurities in each of the phases. It's not like this is all copper and that's all aluminum, but um, that's what's going to happen. Okay? And it can make these really cool structures like that. Okay? And that can change your phase diagram. So let's look at one like this. This is copper nickel. This is a copper nickel phase diagram. It's called an isomorphous binary phase diagram. And what's cool here is that copper and nickel actually have different melting points. Okay, so here along the bottom curve is weight percentage of nickel. So over here on the left at zero, it's all copper. Over here on the right, it's all nickel. Okay, and Reading off here, this is the solid, and then the green is the liquid solution, right? It's melted, in other words. So you can see that nickel will melt at, you know, right around 1100 degrees Celsius, whereas copper melts more towards the 1500 degrees Celsius side. But if you're in between, and let's say that you have a 50-50 mix of copper and nickel, then what's happening is they're kind of competing, right? And you'll get an intermediary uh, melting uh, temperature. Okay, what will also happen is that maybe the nickel parts will melt right away and then the parts that are more copper will um, kind of hang out and then you'll have a mixture of liquid and solid phase there in the middle. So interesting things can happen and these phase diagrams can get a lot more complex. So here's another example. This is a binary eutectic system. So this is copper and silver. So over here, all the way copper, over on the right, all the way silver. And here, there's actually a percentage composition, it's called 71.9% here, this is the eutectic point, right, where the melting transition temperature for the mixture at that weight percentage is actually lower than it is for either of the pure substances. You can see that, you know, here copper about 1100 degrees Celsius, here silver more towards 1000, but at the eutectic point, it's close to 800. This is how they make solder, okay? So they mix two things at a very specific weight percentage that lowers the melting transition temperature of the metal to the point where you can heat it up with a soldering iron and it'll melt, right? So that's the eutectic reaction. So that's kind of cool. And I have a lot more information about this on my material science channel. And when you have a eutectic structure, tin lead solder is another popular one, it looks kind of like zebra stripes when you um, image it. So this is the, uh, in this case, tin and lead layers. And you can see that, the, of course, the lead would be the um, brighter phase here because it's got a larger nucleus than tin in an SEM image. And then, I mean, these phase transition diagrams can actually get really super crazy. This is copper zinc. Um, and they're very different. They form, form all kinds of different, not just liquid phases, but these are all different solid phases. So you've got an alpha phase, a beta phase, a gamma phase, a beta prime phase, an epsilon phase, a delta phase, a gamma phase. I mean, it just keeps going, right? 
And uh, my students always say it's a giraffe, right? So that's what that looks like. So if you have a deeper interest in these um, phase diagrams, they can get really cool, really interesting. The materials can do some amazing things if you pick the right phase. And they have properties that material scientists find very useful. So if you find that interesting, I do encourage you to go over to the material science channel where I talk about this a lot more. Um, but in the meantime, I just wanted to give you a little window into phase transition diagrams and phase diagrams and maybe um, show you that they're not quite as simple as you might have been led to believe in your 1000 level physics class. Okay, uh, thanks so much. I hope you understood that and enjoyed it. And as always, I'll see you in class.